as we all seek to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 6 verse 19a. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness leading to sanctification. Verse 20. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. 21. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now, that's verse 23. But now, right here, right now, that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit that you get leads to sanctification and its end is eternal life. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Yeah. So let's, let's do a quick review um, of these past several weeks and I'm glad I can do it in two sentences. Number one, our freedom, your freedom and my freedom, the freedom of every child of God is through and only through our union with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection, Romans 6, 6, all of the first section of Romans. In the second part of Romans chapter 6 from verse 15, um, we are freed from the law to become slaves of God through the Spirit. See, so that's the question Paul asked. He said, so then, are we allowed to sin or can we go on sinning just because we are not under the law? And he answers it with a resounding no, God forbid. A typical Pauline expression. No, God forbid. In other words, that would be something shocking that because we are free from sin and we are liberated from the law that we use that as an excuse to sin. God did not set us free from those things in Christ so that we can resurrect us to a new life so that we can continue with the old lifestyle. Something is wrong with that thinking. I would dare to say it's messed up. So here is what Douglas J. Moo said. He said the emphasis on Christian slavery is necessary in order to show that the freedom of the Christian from sin is not a freedom to sin. In other words, all what Paul is talking about here in chapter 6, that we've been set free from sin, we've been set free from the law, is not a license for us to go back into that which God delivered us out of. He has, he has set us free for a totally different person. So here's what I wrote for you. In Christ, the Christian is freed from the law so that he or she might overcome sin by walking in the Spirit. Right? And that's what Paul said in, in um, Ephesians. He said, if we live by the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. For those who are walking in the Spirit do not fulfill the lust of their flesh. Douglas J. Moo again. Here's what he wrote again. He said, against those who would insist on the necessity of the law as a force to curb and restrain sin, Paul proclaims the release of the Christians from the power of the law as a necessary step in overthrowing the reign of sin. We'll talk more about that next week when we get into part 11. So here is me again as a little gift for you. Only by walking in the Holy Spirit can we reign in this life having been freed from sin's control. So you are not free, I am not free, nor am I able, nor are you able to triumph over sin on our own. It is only through walking in the Spirit, living in obedience to the Holy Spirit, being sensitive to the Holy Spirit, allowing Him to live out the life of Christ through us. That is how we overcome. That is how we triumph over sin. 
So here is the Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 2 verse 20. What does he say? He said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet it's not I, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So then, why is freedom from sin necessary? Evidently, God sets us free in Christ for a greater purpose than a mundane lifestyle. Now, it's a God set us free for more than getting up, going to work, coming home, going to church, reading your Bible, praying, doing good works. There is a greater purpose for which God has created us. Yet, many of us do not ask why or what is the reason that God has done all these things for us in His Son. So today we are going to seek to begin to examine those things because if we understand that, it causes us to want to embrace the kingdom of God. And remember, we are not talking about a place when we talk about the kingdom of God. We are talking about the rule and the reign of the Lord Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit in each and every one of our lives. So in, in Romans chapter 5, what is this purpose? In Romans chapter 5, verse 17, here is what the Apostle Paul wrote. For if, because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness, watch now, reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. So the whole purpose is that we would reign in life, all of us who have received the abundance of grace, all of us who have been declared rights, having right standing with God, all of that takes place when we come to Christ in faith, accepting Him as our Savior. Once we have done that, we are recipients of the abundance of grace, and we have received the free gift of righteousness. Remember, the Bible says all our righteousness are as filthy rags. There is none righteous, no, not one. Right? Uh, and so um, it is because of the grace of God and because He declares us righteous in His Son that now God has called us, He has freed us so that we can reign, we can rule in this life. We can exercise dominion in this life. So here is what I wrote for you again. Reigning in life is possessing God's promise to Abraham. So when Paul speaks of reigning in life, he is really speaking about our possessing the promise that God made to Abraham. So we have to try to understand this. So let me give you some scripture now and walk you through the text as we seek to gain a greater understanding. Remember what we are not trying to do. We are not trying to use our feelings. We are not trying to say, I thought or I think. We have to let the scripture declare to us what God's intent is and how we go about it. So Romans chapter 4 verse 13. For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world did not come through the law but through the righteousness of faith. For if it is the adherents of the law who are to be the ears, faith is null and the promise is void or has no effect. For the law brings wrath and where there is no law, there is no transgression. Look at the next verse. That is why it depends on faith. In order that, so the reason why it depends on faith is so that the promise may rest on grace, not works, may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his, Abraham's offspring. Notice, not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. There's a lot of stuff there that we will 
examine a little more next week when we talk about it in greater details from Romans chapter 7. So here again is another gift for you, my little pearls of wisdom. As I study the text, I'm gleaning these truths, and so I write them out for you. Abraham's life is the testimony that God calls us out of a place of death and into a place of abundant living through a renewed mind that leads to a transformed life in the Holy Spirit. In other words, it is the Holy Spirit who gives, who renews our minds and so enables us to live out John 10.10. 10. So what does John 10.10 10 say? For he, the devil, comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And Jesus went on to say, But I have come that you might have life and have it to the overflowing or live the abundant life. The abundant life can only be lived by those who are walking in the Spirit, who are sensitive to being led and empowered by the Holy Spirit. This is very important for the believer. Romans 8.14 says, For as many as are led of the Spirit of God, they are the sons or the children of God. So, what is this promise that he should be the ear of the world? In other words, what does it mean when it says that Abraham would be the ear of the world? Now, we are confronted with the entire basis of the new covenant. Because the entire new covenant hinges on this covenant that God made with Abraham. God's promise to Abraham that he and his offspring would be ears of the world. What does ear of the world mean? The promise in Genesis has three components. So this promise that God made to Abraham has three components. So first of all, now Paul kind of summarized it and he just put it to the ears of the world. But the three components are, number one, that Abraham would have a large um, a large offspring, an immense number of descendants. That's number one. Number two, that he would possess the land. Now, Abraham thought at that time that possessing the land had to do with Palestine. But God's initial command in the book of Genesis chapter 1, when God made Adam and Eve, back then God's command was to have dominion over the earth. And so the descendants of Abraham would possess the earth, not just Palestine. Number three is that because they are the descendants of Abraham, therefore not only would they possess the land, but they would become the blessing to all peoples of the earth. In other words, through them, God was going to be bless the entire earth. And we'll be looking, trying to examine those three areas now. So first of all, the immense number of descendants. Historically, prior to Jesus' coming, it was always thought that the descendants of Abraham would be those descendants of Jacob, and then those who were not. So those who came through Isaac and Jacob, those are the descendants of the promise. Those who came through um through Esau, not Esau, Ishmael, those who came through Ishmael, those were not the descendants of the promise, right? Paul, after Christ came, Paul explained that all of that has changed. Now we understand that it is those who share the same faith that Abraham had, they are the descendants to whom God has given the Abrahamic promise which is really a promise to fulfill God's promise or God's covenant made with Adam in Genesis. I'm going to see if I can get to all of that with you. So in Matthew, how then do we, do we get Abraham's kids to occupy the entire earth? Right? So here in Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, the Lord Jesus tells us how this is to be done. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, 
Watch the second part. Teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And as we do that, the Lord says he would be with us even to the end of the age. By making disciples of all people groups for Christ, we are fulfilling God's promise to Abraham that his descendants would occupy the earth. They would possess the earth. Because wherever the children of God are, that is God fulfilling his promise to Abraham. In those days, Abraham was limited to a little space. Now we are all over the world. We are in China, we are throughout Asia, throughout Africa, throughout Europe, um, throughout Australia, throughout Latin, Central and South America, throughout North America. The, the children of Abraham, the possessors of the promise, they are all over the world. But they are not all over the world just to say that they are Christians and to go to church and to sing and to read their Bibles. All of those are important. But there is a greater purpose. So disciple making is not something that is done in a classroom or a service. Disciple making is accomplished as we journey together in life. I want to say that again. Disciple making, making disciples for Christ is accomplished as we journey together in life. Intimate fellowship, living in community, co-creating together, that is how we expand the kingdom of God. Community living, sharing in each other's lives is how disciples are made for Christ. So this is good what we are doing, but it takes more than this to make disciples. We have to engage and interact with each other at a more personal level. Those who lack that will never become true disciples because you are lacking that which your brothers and your sisters have to contribute to your development, that my brothers and sisters have to contribute to my development. This is why co-creating is so important. This is why coming together for fellowship is so important. And those of you whose contact information we have, we've invited you to join us on Zoom today at noon that is all part of this purpose here. So here's what Leon Morris said. It is possible to see prosperity in the terms of the family of faith that Abraham would beget a worldwide family, which is what I just said. So because we are a worldwide family, we are the blessing that God has promised to Abraham that his seed would be an immense group of people. But how then do we possess the land? Because God also promised that he would possess the land. To possess the land is to expand our sphere of influence. It is not just owning a piece of property, and that's very important. That's part of it. But that's not the most critical part, owning a piece of real estate. Now, I want to encourage all of you, make sure you own a piece of real estate. That's vitally important. But of greater importance, we possess the land when we begin to exert influence. It is through influence that we exert the land, and, um, that we, we, we take over the land, that we influence the land, that we bring it under God's control. Now, this has to first of all start with us, and it has to encompass all areas of our lives. Any area of my life or your life that we are not bringing under submission to the Lord Jesus Christ is an area that we cannot influence others to come under the government of God. That is why you see the Bible says, a man who does not rule his own spirit is like a city without walls. And I would say, those of you who know me well, it is like someone who has contracted the HIV virus because what it does is that it attacks the person's immune system and if you have no immune system, then you're vulnerable to anything taking place. A lot of Christians are still trapped in this area because they in refusing to submit to the Lord Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit. We are allowing ourselves to come under the influence of the world. And so you find ourselves, we find ourselves patterning our lives, our thoughts are always going towards 
How do I fit into the world? Well, we're not called to fit into the world. My brother and my sister, we are called to influence the world, and we influence the world when we submit to the Lord Jesus Christ. It is through His power in us, through the Holy Spirit at work in us, that first of all we bring ourselves into submission to Him, and then through the Holy Spirit we exert influence in the lives of other people, and we always influence them for the glory of God, not for ourselves. So, in Mark 16, 20, here is what the Lord Jesus Christ um, said. Um, Mark, here's what Mark said. And they went out and preached everywhere while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the message by accompanying signs. In other words, as we are responding in obedience to the Lord and we are going out and sharing the Lord Jesus with people, in all the different facets of life, as we share the Lord Jesus with people, the Lord says that he will work with us and he will confirm the message with signs following. That message is that Jesus is the Christ. And how does the Lord confirm it? He confirms, C-O-N-F-I-R-M, he confirms the word by bringing people into conformity with his son. In other words, people turn from sin and they come into relationship with God. They're delivered from sin and the law and they are brought into the freedom that comes with the spirit of Christ ruling and reigning in our lives. Acts 6, 7. And the word of God continued to increase and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem and watch and a great many of the priests became what? Obedient to the faith. See, this is it. This is how lives are changed. When people receive the word and their lives are changed because they've become obedient to the faith through the Holy Spirit. So, I wrote for you, we the descendants of Abraham possess the land when we expand the kingdom of God by bringing increasing numbers of people into relationship with Christ. They come under Christ's government. They come under the rule and the reign. No one is legislating this for them. They are not observing rituals and laws and ceremonies. They are being led of the Spirit of God. The life of Christ in us is the Spirit of God at work in us. So as the disciples come under Christ's government, everything under them comes under the government of Christ. And you see, this is the challenge for all of us. Because many of us say we are Christians and that we are following Christ, but we have areas of our lives where we are saying, Lord, don't touch this. Lord, don't touch this part. And we try to say this segment belongs to me. But hear me please, every one of us who are children of God, we, yes, we start off having areas that we protect. But the more we submit to the Holy Spirit, the more we recognize that God is good and all His plans and purposes for us are excellent, we don't need to protect any area of our lives. We need to surrender it to Him. And when we surrender that area of our life to the Lord, that is where we enter into freedom and liberty and we move into the abundant life because we understand and are, and, and are embracing the kingdom of God in that area. So they, because they're submitting to Christ, the more we submit to Christ, the more we expand and we fill the earth and bring it into submission to Him. Right? Um, status is not the issue. In other words, it's not whether you're a missus or a mister because you got a ring on your finger. It's not because you carry a title. What is important is that the kingdom of God expands in our lives first and then through us into the lives of other people. Under the old covenant, the kingdom was expanded through subjugation. In other words, they used to go out and defeat other nations and bring those, make those nations captives to their nation. Under the new covenant, that is not how it expands because that practice under the old covenant of subjugating other people led to rebellion. And so you read throughout the Old Testament that this nation rose up in rebellion against whichever king was in power at that time. But under the new covenant, 
The expansion comes by the renewing of the mind through the Holy Spirit. The influence comes through the renewing of the mind through the Holy Spirit. This is why I say again, the Holy Spirit is such an important person for the believer. Possession of the land must be understood in terms of material prosperity too. Christians must cultivate the mindset of building for future generations. We do this by expanding our crystal-centric businesses. In other words, if you have a job, if you have a business, that job, however you approach that job, you must be approaching it as a child of God, as his ambassador or representative in that community, because our assignment is to take possession, bring that place under the Lord's dominion. If you have a business, if I have a business, it is to be run on the same principle. Everything that we do is with the one focus of bringing everything that we engage into subjection or under the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is why we have been set free from, the, from sin and the law, so that by the Spirit of God, we can live at a different plane where we are always seeking to bring the earth into subjugation. We are seeking to bring everything under the rule and the reign of Christ, not by establishing laws, but by introducing people to Christ who would set them free and give them his spirit who would now influence and guide how they live and then empower them to live out this new life, this amazing life, this abundant life that is only found in the Lord Jesus Christ. Can we get a good amen, please? Wow. Hallelujah. <laughs> so now, the medium of blessing to all people. Here's what um, Thomas Schreiner said. The declaration that Abraham would be the father of many nations equated with the promise that he would have innumerable descendants. That's what I've been saying to you. It is in helping the blind to see, the deaf to hear, right? Those who are dead to come to life, um, those who are impoverished to change the way they think. That is how we are leading people into this abundant life. In Colossians 1, 6, it says that the good news of Jesus changes the lives of people wherever it goes when they hear and understand the things that God has done for them in Christ Jesus. That is how our lives are being changed. As we hear the rainbow word that the Holy Spirit speaks, as we receive it, we understand it, and we apply it, our lives are changed. We are moving from one realm to another, from blessing to blessing. Even the difficulties in our lives, we begin to come as a blessing because we know that God has allowed it to happen for a greater purpose. And as we submit to the Lord and embrace it, our lives begin to change. So now, I, I, there's so much I want to share with you. Look at this now. I have this image of this guy with wrapped in, in dead men's clothing, but they are unraveling as he is rushing towards the light. That is what the good news of Jesus does for us. So I wrote... Being a blessing is to help people to come to true freedom in Christ. This is your assignment, my brother and sister. It is my assignment also. Every Christian's assignment is to loose people, set them free by the power of God so that they can live on the triumphant plane, which is the abundant life in the Lord Jesus Christ. So John 10, 10, Jesus said, The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that you may have life and have it more abundantly. I'm calling on all of us, those of you watching now, those who will watch later, let us not just live on the mundane plane, but let us ascend and let us live on the spiritual plane, the superior plane that God has called us to by the Holy Spirit. Jesus answered them, John 8, 10, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. Watch, the slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. Now that's lowercase s-o-n, right? So if the capital s-o-n, if the son, meaning Jesus, sets you free, you will be free indeed. This is the freedom to which all of us are called to live on this higher plane. So Jesus, through the Spirit, sets us free. He gives us the desire then he empowers us to become the liberated sons and daughters of God. 
And to tell you the truth, the more you engage with your brothers and your sisters, rather than living a selfish, isolated life, the more you get engaged with your brothers and your sisters in Christ, the more your mind would be opened by the Holy Spirit, and the more you would see there's a different plane on which you can live. There is a higher plane, there is greater freedom to which God has called us. And as we do that by submitting to the Holy Spirit, our whole life begins to be revolutionized. And we can just keep going and going because we are living in the community of faith, which gets its life from the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember Jesus said, I am the true vine, but you are the branches. Where do the branches get their, their life from? They get it from remaining in the vine. So we all have to remain in the vine, and the life that flows from the vine is the Holy Spirit. So the renewed mind is key to living in this new life. Here is what Paul wrote. 1 Corinthians 2.14 The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. If you can't understand the things that I'm saying to you today, you need to ask the Holy Spirit to open the eyes of your understanding so that you can grasp it. So here's what I wrote for you again. There is a wholehearted commitment involved in Christian living that propels us to refuse to let sin rule our lives. We now strive with the mind and power of the Holy Spirit to live the abundant life in Christ. Now I'm not saying we're not tempted and we don't get discouraged. But what I'm saying is that because we're living in community and because the Holy Spirit is the life of the, each of us and the life of the community, even when we get discouraged, he would use another believer to encourage us. He would speak a word of encouragement and hope to us because that is how we move into the next level of our walk with God. None of us can live as an island unto ourselves. We all need each other. And more than that, we all need the Holy Spirit. So here is Romans 12, 2. The verse on which this ministry is built. It says, don't copy. This is from the Message Bible. It says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and perfect and pleasing. Let me give it to you from the ESV. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what the will of God is, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Hallelujah. So, Conforming to the world's way shapes those so influenced in every area of their lives. It is indicative of holding on to the mind of the, of, uh, of the slave to sin. In other words, if we are only conforming to the world's standard, if we are conforming to the culture rather than conforming to Christ, what it means is that we have the mind of a slave who is entrapped to sin. We are still placing our, even though we are freed, we are still living like slaves of sin. That is not what God has called us to. Transformation takes place progressively as we cooperate with the Holy Spirit and intentionally choose to embrace, like Abraham, who God says we are, that is, we are the children of God who are called to the abundant life in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what it means to understand and embrace the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. I sought to impart to you a lot of stuff. Let me wrap it up for you. We are through the Spirit, ears with Christ of God's promise to Abraham. The promise that God made to Abraham, you will find recorded in Genesis chapter 12, 15, and a number of other places. But in essence, those promises are all connected right back to Genesis, where God said, let us make man in our image and our likeness, and we will give to them dominion over the earth. But they will exercise.
exercise dominion. Now, this is my translation of the text. They will exercise dominion as they multiply and occupy the earth. So we have to multiply, make disciples, and then as we teach them to obey all things that Jesus has commanded, that is how we bring ourselves first into subjection to the Lord, and then through influence we bring others into it. We possess Abrahamic, the Abrahamic promise through embracing the Spirit's rulership in our lives. This is God's call to all of us. I want to encourage you today. I know you're listening. Oh, the Lord will bless me with a car. You bless me with a big house. You bless me to be debt free. Those are the fruit of possessing the promise that God has given to us in Abraham. They are the fruit of submitting to the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's why I'm saying that. Because when we put ourselves, when we place ourselves under the authority of the Holy Spirit, we will not live a life where we go around building debt and owing other people stuff. Why? The Bible says, Beloved, owe no man anything but to love one another. Number one. So we strive to be debt free. We strive, um, Beloved, I desire above all things that you would prosper and be in health. Now notice, even as your soul prospers, our soul prospers based on the rhema, based on the revelation that God has given to us. To the extent that we know, that is why Paul said to the believers at Rome, he said, Do you not know? Because it is out of knowledge, it is out of embracing or accepting, and then out of counting it to be so, and presenting our members thereafter, that's how we possess. God has called us to greater. There is so much more to life than all of us have been living. As I'm studying these things, I'm astounded myself, and I recognize that I need to go to another plane so I can challenge you to move to another plane. Because as my brother called me yesterday, and he said, I am seeing this thing so much clearer now. It is not that we live in isolation doing our own things. Yes, we have to do that, but we all have to bring them together under the authority of Christ so that we can have a complete house so that we can all prosper and move forward together. That is the life to which God has called us because that is what it means to possess the land because this immense number of children of God are occupying all over their living in unity. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. You and I cannot afford to have animosity in our hearts towards each other. We cannot isolate ourselves from those that God has assigned us to. We cannot just go assigning ourselves to other places. We have to let the Spirit of God lead us. And those who do are the ones who will possess the promise that God has given to us in the Son. Freedom in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray, please. Father and God, today in Jesus' name, we thank you for your word. And even now, Holy Spirit, we pray that you would give clarity to those who have committed themselves to hearing what you have to say. And God, as we hear, we pray that you would grant understanding that faith would come alive, for faith comes through hearing that which you have spoken to us. So God, I pray that your people, all of us, we would hear clearly what the Holy Spirit is saying, that you have not freed us from sin and the law so that we can go back into sin, but God, you have freed us so that we can be, take possession of the promises that you've given to Abraham. And so God, all of us, we would commit ourselves to living this life of freedom in Christ, the newness of life that is found in Christ, which is empowered by the Holy Spirit. We pray this for all of us in Jesus' name. Would you help me say amen, please? Amen. So very quickly, in the few minutes I have left, I want to invite you to join us again on Wednesday. At 7 p.m. where we will be looking at the remaining three seals to be unlocked. Seals 5, 6, and 7. We want to examine those on Wednesday night. And then next Sunday, we will pick up from where we left off. And we'll be going into... We have two more sessions to cover here in understanding and embracing the kingdom of God. We have to talk about the law and what Paul meant by when he spoke about freedom from the law. And then we'll talk about the life of the Spirit after that. 
So join us again um, next Wednesday at 7 p.m. Please, Eastern Standard Time. And then next Sunday, um, that's the 9th, at 9 a.m., where we will pick up from where we left off. I want to ask you to just stretch forth your hand towards us, please. May the Lord bless us and keep us. May the Lord lift up his countenance and be gracious unto us. May the Lord watch over us and give us his peace. In Jesus' name, shalom. We'll see you soon. Bye for now. We love you with the Lord Jesus. Remember those of you whose contact information we have, 12 noon today, we'll be meeting on Zoom. Bye for now. The rest of you, please send us your contact info. Bye.